Okay, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Arno Lepisk. Uh, I work at a company called HiQ. I'm a yeah, software engineering consultant. Working, yeah, well, I usually say my weapon of choice is C++. Uh, currently working with autonomous vehicles. And this talk actually began as Harald had a call out three years ago about some new things in C++ 17. So this is where this uh, started out. And then I, uh, at the moment I was working on a, like a hobby project with, with um, yeah, a, a library with strong types and stuff like that. And I needed to make it possible to well, this allows some constructs and, well, having code that looked syntactically correct but didn't compile. So, yeah, what do I mean by non-compilable code? Well, code which, yeah, it seems correct by a syntactic way, but we have some kind of constraint that will make it not compile. Uh, all my my examples are, as far as I know, valid C++17. I might have been working with some kind of compiler extension. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some things work even down to C++11, sometimes with some tweaks. Okay, let's start with the first example. A non-copyable type. I think most of you have written a non-copyable type at some point, right? How do we test the non-copyable um, property? Well, we can start. We can create a small test program like this. We test the copy construction and we test the assignment uh, assignment uh, operator. Okay, then we compile it, or we try to compile it, and it doesn't work, of course. But how, how do we do this in a systematic way? Well, we can start some kind of um, script. This, this way was where I began. I was using like just a make, usual make system. I made a wrapper for the compiler that more or less just turned the return value around can do that. But then you need to start maybe integrating this in a CI system and then it gets a bit complicated. And when you start to have several compilers, you need a wrapper for each compiler and it quickly starts to get very complicated. Well, we can wrap it in some kind of CMake stuff. And I create a small function. This is a wall of text, I know. Uh, but the key points here is we add an executable that we don't compile by default. And then we add a test that actually tries to compile it and we set will fail to on. This works. I've, uh, I've seen it in use in production code. looks like, like something like this. But then you start thinking unit tests. Well, 0 0.1 seconds per test. And you usually have more than one test or three tests, right? I actually had a colleague right for a couple of weeks ago had problems because their test case took a while to run turned out they had 9,000 test cases. If they ran it in the wrong way, it took half an hour. If they ran it in the correct way, it took like two seconds. Well, it's slow, as I said. And you also need a very careful design of your test cases, and you need a lot of test cases, a lot of small files that you need to keep updated. And 
you must be very sure that, you act, that, that, that it actually fails on the correct thing. That you can do, you can start parsing the output from the compiler, but then you change compilers or change something in your library so the error message gets slightly different and everything fails and you have to start over again. Well, can we do better? Yeah, we have in C++, this is old, older than 17. Um, we have something called type traits. That means we can add some tests on, to check on the types. So in this case, we can, we can statically assert that the type isn't constructible or copy constructible or isn't copy assignable. And if we run this test, well, it's hardly, well, you can't measure the time more or less because if it fails, the compi compilation fails, right? Um, and you don't need to do this in a static uh, way. I will use some kind of yeah, macro, whoop, macro syntax here. Uh, but you, you could also put it into, this is from gtest except true. And if you use a macro, you need double parentheses because otherwise the macro expansion will shoot you in the back because of there's a comma somewhere. Well, maybe not in that case, but in some cases it will very often shoot in the back. But as a convention, from now on, I'll use test just with a single parenthesis. So if you tr want to try it out yourself, rem remember the double parenthesis. Uh, yeah, F and if you want to do, yeah, right. This one in older C++ 17, there, uh, I can go back and, This, uh, not friend. I use the is copy assignable underscore v. That's a shorthand for the colon colon value that was added in C17. Questions so far? No? Everything crystal clear. Uh, but there, of course, we can check other properties. Like, yeah, if, if a class is default constructible, we want, might want to d disallow that. And uh, yeah, check move constructability or if, if we have a virtual uh, destructor and so on. We can also um, check if something is callable in a non-throwable way and so on. But yes, constructors are a bit dull, right? That's Let's check something else. Say you design something and you have methods that shouldn't be callable. The most common example is, well, you have protected or private methods somewhere. I know this is a bit esoteric, but bear with me. Uh, so how do we check that someone, someone evil in your organization takes your beautiful code and changes your protect, protected to public. Well, we have in C++ they added a construct called, well, a trait called is uh, invocable. And it, more or less, it uh, answers the question if we can call something with, a, with arguments of a given type. There's also a variant with underscore R that checks the return value, so it actually returns something. And this is important because it actually doesn't check if the return value is of a certain type, but if, if the return value is convertible to that certain type. Uh, that shot me in the back I would, before I figured that one out. Uh, this is C++17. It's more or less possible to create something like this, at least in C++14. I don't have slides for that, but um, with some digging on CPP reference and so on, it's possible. Well, how do we use it then? Uh, we can 
check. This is, this is the happy case first. This should work. We can call the my IFC method of my class with an int and it will return an int or something that can be converted to an int. It's a bit, a bit we took, we, we take a decal type of the function pointer to a class and then we push the a class pointer as uh, the this pointer and so on. Uh, Clister clear, right? And, and then the not so happy case, observe that there's an exclamation mark before, and then we just check that, well, the internal func isn't callable. Hmm? Yeah? The question was, how does it fail with a similar signature? Yes. Uh, you uh, can only have one signature of a, of a certain type. If, if, if I start adding... Uh, because you take that of type of function pointer, so if my EDC and my internal class have the same signature, like they take in for no parameters, mm -hmm. then the second You, but it takes the function pointer of a member function is with the offset, so it knows which function it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. It does work, at least. I've tested this code. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Different, uh, yeah. One is your date, one is uh, yeah. They Yeah, a member function pointer isn't a normal <coughs> function pointer, it's a strange beast. <coughs> one, one, a comment here was that uh, as they, they are different types, always, as they are member pointers, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm, I don't know if it really the name is part of the type, but something like that. It has, I think it's the offset in the class that's part of the type in some way. Okay. Good. But we can also test for non-existence of functions. We have, we have two classes. One has the, uh, uh, the uh, meth function called func very in innovative name, and the other one hasn't. Here we can call, create a function object which tries to call it. Well, it actually doesn't even try to call it. It just uses the return type to try to figure out if it happens. And we can, and then we can use this. Can we invoke an instance of this function cal caller with class one. Yes, we can, because that has the func member, but the, my class two hasn't, so we, then we can't call it. And this is using, well, sfinae, or what you call it. Is that and this can also be very handy if you do like inheritance with the uh, injection in templates. Then you can check if the, if, the, if the type you put in has certain functions and more or less to get more sane uh, error messages. My next example is overloaded operators. And in the same way as we did with our function objects, we have predefined function objects in the, in the language. And here we just can check that we can add two integers. That's okay. We can add two strings. We can subtract one integer from another, but we can't subtract two strings from each other. 
And this is where my interest actually started because if you think of STD chrono, if you have time points, you can subtract them from each other and get something else that isn't the type of a uh, time point. But you can't add time points together. It's affine spaces or something, it's usually called. A question, yeah? What do the angle brackets of plus and minus do? Yeah, the angle brackets be behind uh, plus and minus are, yes, they, they use it uh, because the plus and minus uh, operator objects in C++ are template-sized. And by just uh, using the empty ones, I use the default. Then it uses type deduction to figure out which the types are. Because normally, I don't remember if this was added in 11, 14, or 17, but before that, the plus and minus operators required the two types you put into them to be of the same type. But by leaving them empty, you, give, you leave it to the type deduction system so it figures out so they can be different types. Good. And when st starting to look at this, we can, um, there are operators missing. So uh, this is a way to implement this for the shift to left operator. And the important part is actually that one because that's the thing that the compiler normally checks. Now it's in line, so I don't really think I would have needed this because it can check the function body for this very simple function. Uh, And then we can check, for example, if something is outputable to a no stream with this. And this, I've seen this more or less in use in places where you print error messages and for types that haven't, that for types that have an output operator, it outputs something is wrong with blah, blah, blah. And in other cases, you can use a const exp if and say, well, something is wrong with this that's unprintable. I've seen that in, uh, actually use in production code. Okay. But there are, of course, things that this doesn't work for. Uh, things that check more things like an internal uh, static assert. You can fail on that still because that isn't uh, evaluated in the S, uh, in the, in the, by the type system but later on in the compilation process. It also doesn't, it also can fail for if, if you do type conversions that you give a warning for, that the compiler normally would warn for and as you all do you have warnings turned on as errors, right? And then sadly this will fail because the compiler only see in, in this phase sees us as a warning, but uh, when you try to compile it for real, then it uh, will get an error. Any questions? Yes. Uh, you can do both. Uh, the question was, is, do you set this up at compile time? You can, of course, do both. Uh, compile time, it's, uh, I think, if you have a, everything const expert and then you have test compile time, and then you can say if it, if it compiles, ship it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've done both. Both compile time and sometimes through, um, um, through a uh, testing framework. And that, well, that's mostly for show because you can show, oh, oh, look how many tests I have because the CI system can keep track of how, how many tests you have. But also sometimes you want to interleave some actual runtime code with it, of course. 
Anyone else? Okay. Then I'm done. Thank you.